Hi, I'm Lou and this is Lily Rowe. Are you wanting to start your own forest school programs but not too sure where to start? In this video, I'm going to give you seven steps to help you set up your own forest school. Forest school comes in all shapes and sizes. It's a very adaptable ethos. So some forest school programs are part of mainstream educational establishments like schools or nurseries. Others have been set up as private businesses. Um, for example, there are kind of full-time forest schools, outdoor kindergarten type uh, businesses that run. Some people set up as freelance forest school leaders and they might operate from a number of different sites and working for different groups. There are also outdoor or educational or charities or establishments that might have forest school leaders and might offer programs at their sites. So it can work very differently in different places. So in this video, I'm gonna try and kind of reference all of those examples of how forest school can work in the seven steps. If you do have any questions about anything I say, do pop them in the comments below. Um, and also if people are interested, I might try and make some further videos to explain in more detail some of these elements, because this is gonna be uh, a kind of brief overview of the main points. So let me share with you seven steps to setting up your own forest school program. I think a tree just fell over a long way over there. That's quite exciting. <laughs> Luckily a long way away. <laughs> Step one is making sure that forest school is definitely the approach that you want to use. There are lots of other types of outdoor learning out there. Forest school is just one particular way of working with people outside and it has a distinct philosophy. Um, if you're new to forest school, do check out my What is Forest School video. I'll pop the link in the description below. Um, I've also got a video that explains outdoor learning and forest school and how it fits in. So I'll pop that one down there too. So do check out those if you're completely new. So forest school comparatively does take quite an investment in terms of time and energy and money because it involves having a training qualification and it's about regular contact with the natural world. So compared to some other types of outdoor learning, it might require more commitment. So it's really essential that you make sure you fully understand what it is and what's involved with it. Um, there are also a lot of misconceptions out there about what forest school is and so do make sure you do your research and your homework to kind of get a really solid understanding of the philosophy. It, also if you're working for somebody else or you, you know, you're a teacher in a school, do make sure it also aligns with your senior management's vision for what they want as well um, because I know of forest schools where there has been problems where practitioners were like yeah let's do forest school and senior managers were having something else in mind and that's caused problems once things have got started. Do consider what your main aims and outcomes are for running sessions. So for example, if you're based in a school and you're, you want curriculum based outcomes, then actually maybe forest school isn't quite the best fit. Maybe um, curriculum based outdoor learning would be a better fit if that's your priority. Um, likewise, if you want to teach people about environmental issues or the natural world and that kind of cognitive understanding is your main focus, then maybe environmental education or earth education is a better fit for that purpose. Um, However, if you want to build people's emotional resilience and self-esteem and confidence, um, then that's what Forest School is designed to do. So if that's your main aim, <laughs> then Forest School hopefully will be the best fit for you. Step two is thinking about getting your Forest School training or thinking about your Forest School staff. So at a minimum, the person or people running the forest school programme will need to be trained to level three in forest school. So that's the leadership qualification. Um, if you're a school or an organisation, you've kind of got two choices. You either are going to train up your own staff um, or you could buy in existing forest school staff. So there are pros and cons of both approach. 
If you decide to train up your own staff, then there is a bit of investment in terms of time and money it's going to cost to pay for the course, possibly supply cover. It also takes about nine months to a year to do the level three course. So you might have a little bit of a wait before you're able to start running programs. But then of course, you've got staff in house as part of your organization or as part of your school. That might be a more long-term sustainable uh, way of working. Then on the other side, you could buy in people and that means they'll be able to work straight away. So you'll be able to run programs straight off, um, but they might involve more communication between organisations. And also you've got to find somebody who's able to do that, either another business or organisation or a freelancer. If you are looking to do forest school training, then do do your research as there is a variety of different training providers out there. and in some ways forest school training isn't really regulated um, so there is a whole variety of different courses and things so do look for quality training providers um, and make sure that the course that they're offering is an actual recognized qualification um, if you're new to this and you don't know where to start i recommend checking out the forest school association which is the uk charity for forest school and they've got lots of impartial advice uh, and they also run a scheme to endorse training providers so you can find out more on their website i'll put a link in the description below once you've got your training then you need to think about your staffing ratios of running your sessions so in an ideal world your assistants whether they're staff or volunteers would have the level two qualification in forest school which is designed for people who regularly assist at a forest school um, but if that's not possible then that's not the end of the world but I would strongly recommend making sure that the forest school leader the level three trained person provides some sort of in-house training that explains their roles and responsibilities and ideally um, some of the skills as well so that they're better able to support the learners at their forest school. In terms of the actual ratio and the numbers there is no fixed ratio. Um, however, because of the nature of Forest School being about working with people's emotional development, it does tend to have a higher adult to child ratio than other types of outdoor learning um, because of the sort of work that we're doing. Um, so I would encourage you to look at the age of the learner, perhaps the needs of the learner, if they're particularly vulnerable, you're going to need a higher ratio. Um, and also maybe some of the activities that you think might be taking place, because again, from a health and safety point of view, you might need a higher adult to child ratio as well. So think about that, look at your risk assessments to know what a good ratio would be. Step three is thinking about other training guidance or legal requirements that you might need to know about. So as well as forest school training, there might be other things to think about. And I'm thinking particularly if you're setting up your forest school as a business or working as a freelancer. So forest school level three leadership training covers all the ins and outs of how you run forest school sessions, you know, day to day operational stuff, but it doesn't tell you about how to set up businesses or run businesses properly. So this is an area that I really strongly recommend if you're not already used to business and this is your first time working as a freelancer or setting up a business to get some advice and training, certainly in some key aspects like business planning, um, finances and accounting, record keeping, uh, maybe even marketing, branding, all of those sorts of things. Uh, if you're in the UK, probably there's a plane going up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love military planes. La, 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 la. Go away, plane. Go away, plane. doing a circuit. If you're in the UK then your first port of call for advice about business probably will be the government's website which is .gov.uk forward slash business and there's lots of information there about how to go about setting up and legal requirements and things like that. 
there also usually is local business support or enterprise support so there might be local networks to you as well which might be able to give you some pointers or advice part of the level three forest school leadership course is to create a handbook and that is kind of your policies and procedures for operating your forest school these policies might show areas that you might also need further training in so for example you might need to do some outdoor first aid training um, you might need to do some safeguarding children training if you haven't done that already you might need a food hygiene qualification because you're cooking lunches out on the fire for example so there may be other training courses the plane's back <laughs> So there might be other training courses as well as the level three for a school course. There are other elements that you might need to consider, particularly if you're setting up your own business. Um, for example, if you're setting up a nursery, you might need to be registered with Ofsted as a childcare provider. Um, you would also need that if you're running a childminding business. Uh, if you're operating a nursery, you might need qualifications in childcare or early years. Uh, if you're operating as a freelancer and kind of doing PPA cover, you know, covering classes in a school, you might need to be a qualified teacher for the schools to be able to allow you to do that unaccompanied. You would also need to make sure that you've got a DBS check or a disclosure and barring services check, um, which is a requirement for working with children or vulnerable people in the UK. I expect other countries have got something similar. And lastly, you'd also need to think about insurance. Um, so if you're already working in an organisation or a school, you need to check that your existing insurance will cover the things that you'll be doing in forest school. Uh, if you're running your own business or a freelancer, then you're going to have to sort out your own insurance and make sure that it's adequate for what you're doing at forest school. Step four is finding a site. So you don't necessarily need a pristine woodland to do forest school. In fact, in many ways, a pristine woodland might be too precious to be running forest school in. But you do need some sort of natural site, an outdoor space of some sort. Now, there's no doubt that having a woodland within walking distance would be a perfect ideal for a forest school. But at the end of the day, we've kind of got to work with what we've got. Um, in terms of site, you're going to have two main categories. You're either going to be working on land that you or your organisation owns, or you're going to be using somebody else's land. If you're using somebody else's land, I'd strongly recommend having some sort of written agreement with the landowner that explicitly states what permissions they're granting you in terms of access, in terms of harvesting materials, uh, in terms of uh, lighting fires, things like that that you need legal permissions for. In terms of the space itself, it's useful to have enough space for some free roaming. It's quite nice for children to be able to have areas where they can't always be seen constantly by adults. So maybe some hidey places or bushes or trees that they can kind of get into like dens. Um, having a space somewhere where you can create a, an, a circle area, whether that's fixed seating or like logs to, to sit on. Um, having an area where you can put up some sort of semi-permanent shelter. Again, that might be just simply a tarp that's thrown up in wet weather, or it might be a bell tent or a yurt or something a little bit more sturdy. Um, it's also very helpful to have loose parts to use some play language. So there's sticks and branches or pine cones or conkers or seeds. So a, quite a natural environment where things are left in situ because all of these loose parts are going to stimulate creativity and imagination and children are going to use it in their play. So you don't want to tidy an area. I only mention this because some forest schools happen in school grounds or in gardens or parks which tend to be more tidy. Um, if that's the case for you, then forest school is still doable in those areas, but it might take a little bit more effort, a little bit more creativity on part of the practitioners through bringing in additional materials so that you've got those resources. So step five is kit and equipment. So forest school 
focuses very much on connecting with nature and using natural materials. So you don't need lots of expensive equipment to be running forest school. However, at the beginning, there might be certain essential bits and pieces to consider. So for example, clothing is vital. So all participants and staff and volunteers will need proper outdoor clothing because forest school happens all year round. Uh, if people don't have the right sort of clothes, then they're going to be uncomfortable or even worse, get hypothermia, for example, in cold and wet conditions. So that's absolutely essential. Um, I've got a video on how to dress the outdoors at forest school. I'll pop the um, link in the description below. Then there's also infrastructure to think about. Now, depending on your site, you may already have some of this in place or you might need to start from scratch. So things like, are there toileting facilities or do you need to build a composting toilet, for example, or at least some area that's screened off that could be dug out as a latrine? Um, you know, water, is there access to drinking water or do you, you need to put a, a potentially a water pipe in or think about jerry can systems to be able to get drinking water there. Um, also thinking about uh, shelter, semi-permanent shelter. Is there an area that could be used for that? Are you going to just use like a tarpaulin and rig it every session or are you going to have something that's a little bit more fixed in place? Could be something like a hazel bender or it could be uh, a, a, a yurt or something like that. So those things I might need thinking about. Then there's kind of essential health and safety equipment that you need to think about, such as first aid kits and emergency equipment. I tend to at Forest School carry more than just a first aid kit. I've got other bits and pieces like emergency shelters, things um, to look after a person if you had to wait a long time for an ambulance uh, that I keep in a big red rucksack called Alan, incidentally. But <laughs> you might need to think about those sorts of things. You might need to also think about if you're having fires, there might be certain equipment, um, fire blankets, heat proof gloves, things like that, that you might need to buy. So there's health and safety type equipment that you'll need. Then finally, although we do tend to use natural materials a lot of the time, there might be a few essential basic kit that will help do some of the activities that you might end up doing at Forest School. I'm thinking things like ropes and tarpaulins, good for den building, good for rope swings, rope bridges, that kind of thing. String and craft type materials might be handy, clay, that kind of stuff. Um, oh dear pups. String and craft materials might be handy. Also things like clay, if you haven't got clay on site that you can dig out the ground. Maybe things about looking at wildlife, bug pots, ID guides and books, perhaps a few of those. Maybe some baskets or bags to help with collecting stuff. Uh, maybe also a few, few tools. I mean, Forest School does use tools and fire, but um, not always, not necessarily every session, and it depends very much on the group. So you can get away with quite a simple, basic starting kit in terms of activities, but there is all the sort of health and safety bits and infrastructure bits that you would need right at the beginning of the programme that you kind of buy once, as it were. Step six is funding. So starting a forest school might require a bit of investment at the beginning in particular. There might also be some ongoing costs as well. Now, depending on how you're setting up your forest school and the different arrangements you've made with the site and things, um, the, the amount can vary hugely. But the sort of things that you need to consider in your budget when you're first planning uh, is, well, first of all, training. If you're training your own staff or you're training yourself, then you're going to have to put some money aside for that. Possibly also you're going to need supply cover so that that member of staff can... Um, you know go out and do the training days then there's the site so you might be purchasing your own land or you might be renting the land or you might be paying on a session by session basis so that's something that you might need some money for um, you also might need to invest a little bit on infrastructure so if you were for example putting in a water source or building a composting toilet or some sort of semi-permanent shelter or 
a yurt or something like that, then that would cost some money. Then there's also the clothing, kit and equipment as well, that you might need at least a basic start-up set of equipment. There might also be annual costs to pay every year as well, such as your insurance, um, possibly getting tree surveys done by professional arboriculturists to check the health of the trees. Perhaps you've got memberships to professional organisations as well. So there's things that might come out every year. In terms of how people pay for this, again, it will vary depending on situation. Uh, in some schools or organisations that already exist, they perhaps just put money aside for it in their existing budgets, um, just like they would any other curriculum area, for example, in schools. Um, other organisations, if they're not for profit, they might be able to receive grants, certainly in the beginning, to help them set up and to purchase uh, equipment and land and things. If you're a private business, you won't be able to necessarily access grants, but you might be able to get loans from banks or private investors. Um, I know some forest schools have even received sponsorship money from other businesses, particularly when it comes to things to do with infrastructure or clothing. Um, you know, some companies like to have their logo saying sponsored by, you know, so and so. Um, so they've managed to access money that way. So there's lots of different ways people have funded forest school programs. So finally, step seven is finding a group to work with or people to work with. Now, depending on how your forest school is set up, that might be very easy or it might be a little bit more tricky. If you're working in an existing school or setting, you presumably have already got groups of children that you're going to be working with. So you might not need to think about it too hard. Um, however, there might be logistical aspects that you need to work out such as timetabling or how you divide the groups up or communicating with parents. If you're setting up a business or a freelancer um, or you're a, a, an outside organisation like an environmental organisation, you might be looking for customers, you might be looking to work with existing groups like schools and nurseries or youth groups. So in that case, you're gonna need to think about how you're gonna market yourself to those providers um, Again, this is where getting some business advice might, might help you. Um, if you are a qualified teacher, as well as a forest school leader, you might be able to do things like supply cover. Um, and in the past, I've worked as a supply teacher covering a regular afternoon slot, which is the PPA cover for a class teacher, their planning and preparation time. So it was a weekly session. Um, and because I was a qualified teacher, I was able to come in and take the class every week for forest school um, out in the school grounds. So that's one option if you're a teacher as well. As forest school is rooted in emotional development, it can be a very effective approach to use with learners with uh, particular needs or emotional behavioural difficulties or mental health issues. Um, so as well as uh, educational establishments, you might also want to consider marketing to intervention services um, such as charities that might work with children uh, struggling with mental health or perhaps PRUS, pupil referral units, young offender units, things like that. Um, and do remember, of course, forest school is not just for children. Um, forest school programs could happen with adults as well. So that also would expand your potential clients if you like. Something that is really important regardless of how your forest school is set up is communication. Communication, communication, communication um, because in my experience that's where there can be problems potentially if your partner organisation or your customers don't fully understand the forest school ethos it can throw up issues once the program gets started so regardless of whether you're in a school or whether you're running a business or whether you're working with young offenders whoever make sure you've got a good communication strategy and you talk before the program starts to all the key stakeholders so that they fully understand what they're kind of getting into um, and particularly gain parental consent or carer consent for the individuals um, if they're coming to forest school so that they understand what's going to happen so there you have it, seven steps to setting up your own forest school programme. Do you have some tips for people who are first starting out? Do let us know in the comment section below. 
Also, I am thinking about maybe doing a series on this and expanding in more detail about some of these steps. So yeah. if that's something you'd like to see or there's a particular area or question, then also write that in the comments section below. Yeah. If you've enjoyed this video, do consider giving us a, a like and subscribing to our channel so that you can join us in the woods again next time. And thanks for watching. Starting a forest score is lots of fun, just as long as you know what's to be done. Use seven steps to plan effectively before setting up and heading to the trees. <laughs>